So we may have a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars. Rob, isn't that about what it costs? Oh, okay, here you are muted. I believe in years past it was about four hundred dollars is, is what we had set aside for a social event. Yeah, but did we spend that much? I don't think we ever spent that much. Well, Tom, I don't think you ever reimbursed, so we didn't spend anything for that one. <laughs> that is true. I never got reimbursed. The other thing is this year, if, if we go back to face-to-face -to -face at some point, there may be a, a fee for wherever we wind up, given on what's open and what's not. So I, I personally have on the opinion of, of maybe erring on the side of caution and dropping it to 600. Does anyone else have an opinion on the matter? I would like to stay at 600. It doesn't mean we can't increase it next year. Well, like any nope. charitable organization. Mr. Ralph Foster has raised his hand. He can't speak, yeah. but he's raised his hand. Ralph, go ahead and type what you want to say, buddy. While we're waiting on Ralph, any or charitable organization is has lost income this year just by default because of this COVID thing. So that foundation is probably hurting for money this year. Yeah, um, Ralph, did, did you have anything you wanted to add? I saw you raised your hand. Was that was that an error? He's still trying to learn teams. Operator error. All right. All right. So, so Tom, I I think you're trying to say that you you believe we should increase it. Uh, yeah, that's what I would propose. Increase it by some minimal amount, but uh, by some small amount anyway. All right, does anyone else have an opinion? No, no, Hanson, no, no opinion. Legrand, no, no opinion. <laughs> All right, let's go and put it to a vote. Let's kind of see where we lay. Um, if maybe we could type our votes so that those that can't speak can also, that would be great. So uh, either put a yes or a no, Y or N, in, in our conversation here, and we'll go for a vote right now. What are we voting on? What? What? Uh, to, to, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is to. <laughs> that that's a great question. Um, yes to the blank check. <laughs> yes to the blank check. So, let's let's go and start this over. I'll go ahead and put a dash. So, um, after that little dash, go ahead and um, we're voting on. Is it showing up? Do you guys see what I type? No. That's your typing, I don't see anything. There we go. Apparently, if you type dash signs, it doesn't do anything. So now we're going to vote on increasing it to 25. So uh, to, to 700, from 675 to 700. So an increase to $25. All in favor? Respond with yes or no. <laughs> All right, Eric, I think you're the deciding factor, buddy. <laughs> and it's no. So we'll we'll go with six hundred this year, uh, just to keep it at what he has recommended, and we'll we'll go with that. So. Well, we actually have to vote on that. Oh, all that's right. A, that's a different motion. Um, so I guess if, if that fails, then we'll we'll stick at 675. Uh, I guess that's where we'll be. So what if we but, didn't reduce it to 600, just kept it where it was last year? Is that not the op an option as well? That, that is also an option. So that's that's the default here. So below the dash, um, we are proposing we decrease it to 600. All in favor say yes. All opposed say no. If the opposed wins, then we will stick at 675.
All right, so we're going to decrease to 600 that that one today. So, whew, that was rough. All right. It's fault. I, I think I think we finally made it through it. Is there any other new business on the floor today? Have you heard anything more about the PE problem writing sessions? No, not a I peep. didn't see anything in the conference schedule. When I talked to Julie, she said they were still trying to figure out figure that piece out. OK. Have we heard anything more about that sprinkler project downtown Augusta? Negative. Nope. Like you mentioned earlier, Tom, COVID has not been kind to the nonprofits. So it's it's been it's been silent for a while. Anything else? Ralph's typing. Yep. Thank you very much, Ralph. Wrapping it up at 6 p.m. So if I can get a motion to close. Motion. We need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Bam. We close. All right. So without further ado, um, how do you how do you say your last name? Gudati? It's Gadotti, yeah. Jay Gadotti. Now I Sorry, I had to leave and I I, I, had, I haven't downloaded Teams, so it wouldn't let me share screen. So I saw that before. I'm glad I was paying attention. But now it looks like I'll be able to hit the share screen button. I guess if you don't download it, you can't share it. But it's Jay Gadotti with STI. All right, Jay. So I think without further ado, you got the floor, buddy. Go for gold. All right. So I'm going to hit share screen to see what happens. This is my first time with... Uh, what in the world? Can you guys see my screen or do I have to click something here? Yep, so you click oh. the share screen button, uh, the share content at the top, and then it should pop up with all these little boxes of which window you want to share, and you select which one you want to actually display. Okay, it should be that one. There it is. There it is, man. We see Firestop overview. All right, From and you got the, all right, and I can't see, I've just got this little box in the bottom with nobody's picture, but I, that's fine. Just let me know if something goes wrong. Is this working? Yep. Everything looks great. Yep. Outstanding. You're going through the screens. We see it. All right. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, absolutely. And and you guys are 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 close to my heart because my wife is a fire protection engineer. Believe it or not, um, in North Carolina, she's a member of what's the chapter you're a member of, honey? SFPE Carolina. Charlotte. Uh, SF SFPE of the Carolinas, and she works for Parsons. If you guys didn't know that about me already. So, um, so I know what you guys deal with on a daily basis. Um, what we're going to do today is basically the fire stop overview. Uh, it, it does give you a one hour credit. I did send that information and what I'll need is somebody to send me the list of everybody that attended at the end. And then I can uh, get you guys certificates and get your one hour as well uh, submitted. Uh, with that being said, thank you again for, for the opportunity. Um, my name is Jay Gadotti. I work directly for Specified Technologies. I'm the territory manager for the Carolinas and uh, including Bermuda, which I negotiate. I used to have Virginia and I traded Virginia for Bermuda years ago and it was a good trade. So we just, uh, we wrapped up a hospital out there and we just finished the airport as, as actually coming to a close. So that was a fun project to work on. You know, I'm just the manufacturer. So I just go out for technical support, make sure they're doing it right. Um, but work with a lot of the contractors that are installing my product. All right, if there's any questions during this too, you know, feel free to reach out or feel free to speak up and let's answer them. Uh, okay, here's the uh, Firestop Overview event ID, and this will give you a one hour AIA or uh, CEU credits, depending on what you need. Um, and like I said before, at the end, just give me a list of everybody's names and I'll be able to submit that, or it may be self-submitting, I'm not sure uh, what you guys typically do. Do you know if it's self-submitting or will I need to get you submitted for the, the credit? Does anybody know? We'll figure that out at the end. All right, oh, well, here it is. This might tell you. So it's AIA or CES course FSO 906. So I, I should have read through this at the beginning. I've been through the presentation, just didn't read all the fine print here. So we'll figure this out at the end, but um, take a screenshot of that if you need that or, or take a picture with your phone. If you need that, I'll give you guys a few seconds to do that.
All right, and of course, this is copyrighted, so we have to show this. Um, I can't really alter or change any slides without it being redone and resubmitted for the, the credit as well. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, the, the topics of discussion are going to be what is Firestop, why Firestop, who requires Firestop, how Firestop is tested, uh, Firestop is a headache, of course it can be, uh, Firestop product options, install, installing Firestop, system selection, and then at the end, just a fiction uh, versus fact. So what is Firestopping? Um, does anyone know what Firestopping is? Um, it's that expensive red goop with the UL logo on it, as we all know. It, it typically becomes a problem on a project if, if nobody's paying attention to it to begin with. It's something that the inspectors are paying very close attention to, especially if you're familiar with Charlotte and the surrounding areas, Columbia, Greenville, Raleigh, um, Clemson, all those areas, they, they do look at Firestop pretty strongly and pay close attention to it. Some areas are better than others. You know, we kind of look at Mecklenburg County, which is, is Charlotte, um, as the third toughest jurisdiction in the country. Uh, Las Vegas is number one. Orange County, Florida is number two. Charlotte's number three. Uh, Vegas had the big MGM Grand Hotel fire in the 80s that really stepped up ever since then. They had a big loss of life. Uh, there was a nursing home fire in Orange County, Florida, which has, has kept all the inspectors uh, on top of the fire stop game. Charlotte hasn't had the fire uh, with any loss of life yet. They don't want one. So they've seen that it's an important thing and they're, they're keeping, keeping it at the top of the list when it comes to inspections. Um, so the process of restoring the hourly fire rating back to a barrier, uh, whether it's a wall or a floor that has lost the fire rating from penetration joints and other openings using material tested for the ASTM E814 or UL 1479. And then C, of course, it's a huge pain in the neck. Um, it's the answer is all of the above when it comes to what is fire stopping. And truly it's B, but the other two make sense as well. Uh, three elements of fire protection. You've got prevention, suppression, and containment. You know, pre prevention is using as many non-combustible building materials as possible. Concrete, steel, uh, sheetrock, things that aren't going to burn. We want to make the buildings more comfortable, so we do put in combustible materials. Um, the next step of that is suppression, which you guys are very familiar with, whether it's a, a, a fire control system, sprinkler system, um, you know, even your, your, uh, your fire alarms your emergency lighting, you know, all those things kind of factor into that area, but suppression is really comes down to the fire sprinkler system. Um, and then where fire stop comes in is we're part of the containment system. And that's sometimes referred to as passive compartmentation. Um, the fire is prevented from progressing to another area. This is also known as passive fire protection. So that's where we come in. You build rated barriers, rated walls, rated floors, and then we give you the ability to seal the joints between them and anything you need to pass uh, th uh, through them, whether it's a plastic pipe, metal conduit, you know, there's a million different things that, that, that keep coming up and there's new things every day that we see and we have to test. Uh, what is compartmentation? It's the practice of uh, partitioning building spaces into smaller compartments by constructing barriers. Walls, floors uh, can withstand the passage of fire, smoke, and superheated gases over specific periods of time. So it, it's basically, making the building so if you look at a Lowe's or a Home Depot uh, or a Walmart there's not a lot of compartmentation in there people are there they're awake they're they're moving around if the fire alarm goes off they head towards the exits think of a hospital an assisted living center something like that you've got people asleep you've got people uh, in the beds plugged into the wall and life support you've got babies in the NICU you've got elderly that are immobile so you look at types of types of facilities built like that, they're going to have a lot more compartmentation than a strip mall or something like that would. So that's an example of what compartmentation is. Uh, what's a through penetration? Anything that breaches the fire barrier. So while penetrations and fire barriers are most often electrical or mechanical service lines, structural members, you know, you've got I-beams, um, treated and untreated, you've got all different types of stuff that can be penetrating those, those uh, rated barriers and they all have to be treated to, to reduce um, the spread of the toxic smoke and gases in the in the facility. Uh, what is fire stopping? Is the process of installing a third party tested material to restore the hourly fire fire rating to a fire barrier wall and floor that has lost their rating from the through penetration, uh, membrane penetrations, construction joints, gaps, and other such openings. Uh, here's an example of a typical UL. If you look at if you look at ULs, we've got I think STI we've, we're at about 1,500 ULs currently, so we're constantly testing as new items come out, new types of barriers, new types of construction come out. We have to constantly be testing these because uh, ULs are very specific. They're going to call out the barrier, 
They're going to call out the opening size. They're going to call out what penetrations are allowed, and they're going to list them specifically, and then they're going to tell you how to seal it. And that's what is typically laid out in a standard UL 1 through 4. Some ULs are 1 through 10. Some are even longer. And where that really expands is you'll have uh, a variety of penetrations. You could have ducts, you know, multiple uh, types of penetrations, metal pipe, plastic pipe, and an air duct all going through the same hole. We have systems for those. That system would be one, two, three, four, five for the penetrations, and then six for how to seal it. So they do get longer, but a typical standard basic UL is broken up into four parts. Do you have approved uh, designs? Yes. Yeah, we've got 1,500 UL designs currently. Uh, 1500 okay. plus. What's that? I, I was just going to ask, uh, are they on your website or electronically or are they still in the booklet form? Uh, we quit doing the book, I'd say five years ago, uh, just because by the time we would get the book printed, it was already out of date because there's 100 new systems that we just had tested and they, they aren't in the book. So we actually have a, a system search on our website. And then we also have an app available for your phone, whether you've got Apple or Android, it's free to download. It's just go, just type in uh, STI Firestop in the, the app search and you'll see we've got three apps. You wanna look for the system search, it's free to download and you can search all of our UL systems very quickly through that app. It just breaks it down, says what's your, what's your barrier, what's your penetration and, and boom, it'll, it'll pop up all the ULs and, and it's a really, really uh, quick way to find your UL systems. It can get complicated. I, I know it forwards and backwards. So if you ever are needing a UL system, you know, give me a phone call, shoot me an email. I can look it up for you really quickly, get it back to you. And then we'll talk about EJs as well. If a UL doesn't exist, we can also do an engineered judgment. Okay. There's also FM systems and uh, Omega as well, but generally the industry follows the UL systems. But if you are doing an FM facility, we've got, I think, 50 or 60 FM systems. And then we've got probably 100, 200 plus from Omega Point. Uh, Omega Point will test some stuff that UL won't, so we had to go to Omega Point for those systems. Nothing wrong, they're all three great uh, test standards. It's just UL is really the, the, the standard of the industry, so we stick with them. Uh, as, so what uh, underwriter laboratories, and this is the definition of fire stopping from UL. Um, a fire stop system is a specific construction consisting of a wall or floor assembly a penetrating item passing through an opening in the wall or floor assembly and the materials designed to prevent the spread of fire through the openings. They almost need to update that a little bit because you've also got curtain wall assemblies um, that they kind of leave out in that definition, but um, it may, still makes sense to me. On um, curtain walls, um, do you touch on that in here a little bit, Jay, or no? We'll get to, you know, this is just real basic, um, but I, you know, we are definitely the experts when it comes to curtain walls. We're doing all the major curtain walls in, in Charlotte, Raleigh, um, basically in the surrounding areas, all the big the big towers. So we're really good at curtain walls and, and uh, we understand them pretty well. So and then we also have two or three, I, th I think 200 roughly curtain wall systems in our directory. Um, and we're the problem with curtain wall is every every time we see a new curtain wall, it's different. So a lot of them don't match systems. So we're, we're typically EJing those. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, they've got to the point where the spandrel panel is about 12 inches. It yes. transoms even with the floor, and there's barely anything there. We've even got the all vision curtain walls. If any of you guys have run into those yet, those are challenging, but we have a gutter system, we call it, that handles that as well. So we're definitely can help you with curtain wall. Unfortunately, I do not go through it in this. It, it you know, would be a little bit more advanced training to get into curtain wall. We could do a whole training just on curtain wall. Um, if you'd like to do that in the future, we can definitely do that. So what is fire stopping? You've got through uh, or membrane penetrations displayed here, kind of giving you an example of both. Uh, currently, uh, a through penetration, you know, goes through both sides of the wall. A membrane penetration goes through part of the wall. Right now, you would use the same UL for both. Uh, UL's definition of a membrane penetration is you just apply half of the through penetration UL system to treat it. So if it says 5 8 inch of sealant on each side of the barrier, you just install the five eight inch of sealant on this on the one side of the barrier and here you've got a cpvc pipe smaller two inch and smaller we can handle it with intumescent fire stop um you don't have to get up into the collars or anything like that it's gonna that stuff's gonna expand collapse the plastic stop the fire smoke and gas from getting through the barrier you know we've got one two three and four hour ul systems for that type of, of uh, install uh, joint system 
So a joint system is a specific construction consisting of adjacent walls and or floor assemblies and the material designed to prevent the spread of fire through a linear opening between the wall and or floor assembly. So here's where they need to add in the curtain wall, but you get the idea. So that's as defined uh, by UL, a fire stop joint system. And here you see gypsum wallboard. It's not a great picture, but you see gypsum wallboard going up to a, a fireproofed underside of the deck. It's also going around an, a structural I-beam. Everything's sprayed with SFRM, and our product can just be sprayed between, uh, if there's enough SFRM in the joint, you can use that as the mineral wool, but usually there's a little bit of a joint. You'll pack that full of mineral wool, and then you'll spray an eighth of an inch of our fire stop spray. The one you're seeing here is a light blue color. It also comes in a red, which is more the standard of the industry, but blue's nice if you ever want to paint it. It's easier to paint over. So why fire stopping? Uh, why fire stopping is to prevent the transmission of toxic smoke, flames, superheated gases, and heat through openings and fire barriers that have been created for through penetrations, membrane penetrations, blank openings, and joints. Um, here you see a, a picture of a bunch of conduit going through a sheetrock wall. You know, notice here, they were kind of planning ahead. They didn't just make a giant hole. They put these through individually. So you're essentially using a single penetration UL system a bunch of times. Uh, instead of having a giant hole and then trying to find a way to fire stop. So sometimes it's better to make less opening than it is to make more opening. You know, if this was a cable tray or some sort of high traffic opening where you need to get back through it a bunch of the bunch of times throughout the life of the building, then you may want to make a bigger hole, use something like pillows or something like that. But this would really be the best, most cost effective way to treat those conduits. Are there any requirements for how far apart those single penetrations need to be? There's guide. really there's really not. Now, in some ULs, if you've got multiple, you know, in the mixed multiples, we will call out a spacing. But when it comes to, in this scenario, these are all treated individually. And, you know, there's nothing that states you can only have so many holes in the wall or you can only have so much, dis you know, a minimum distance between the pipes. Essentially, if there's a, if there's a bit of sheetrock there, then it's okay. Um, you know, okay. There's nobody that's defined it any differently than that. Now, the authority having jurisdiction could could not be happy with that um, and may may throw out a requirement. Hey, I want a half inch. I want an inch. You know, your, your sheetrock's going to fall apart there. You've only got a sliver. Um, I have seen that happen, but there's nowhere where it's stated, you know, an exact uh, distance between them in this scenario. Only in a system that would have everything going through the same hole would you sometimes have to space, you know, the metal clad cable bundle from the PVC pipe that's all going through the same opening. There's a, usually a half inch requirement. So you can get it sealant between them and it, because that PVC pipe is going to really need the intumescence to seal it off. Okay, thanks. Yep. We've been waiting for somebody to define that, but nobody has. So, you know, we just kind of, I don't recommend putting them, you know, just a sliver of sheetrock. I always try to say have an inch or so. Uh, it's kind of what I usually recommend, but people will do what they will. And, you know, it really falls back on the authority having jurisdiction, the inspector, uh, the building inspector at that location or the engineer on record, you know, whoever's doing the third party inspecting for that project. So are are the installers required to be or the inspectors required to be certified? No, nobody is. You know, it's not its own trade at this point. Um, the only time that you will see now the inspectors aren't at all. Um, they just it's you know, they're recommended to have a good background in fire stopping and their credentials are really what certifies them if they have experience and know what they're doing. Um, but when it comes to the installers, so like a fire stop installer or an electrician or a plumber, there are two licenses that you can get. One is a UL license. The other one is an FM license uh, or certification, I should say. But those are only driven by the spec. There's nothing in the building code requiring that. It's just if the, you know, if it's a hospital facility or big government job or, or you guys put it in the specification saying that you must be UL or FM certified in order to install, install fire stop on this project then that really takes it away from all the trades and you've got to get somebody with that certification and really the only people that have that are the true fire stop installers the fire stop carolinas the AAA fire stop the carolina insulation um, those are just a few that have ul or fm certifications there's roughly 14 installers in the carolinas and of those 14 i'd say 10 of them have either ul or an fm license and those licenses cost about fifteen thousand dollars and then there's another five thousand dollars a year. So the, to get them, it's fifteen grand, and then five thousand dollars a year because you have to get audited every year, and that's to pay for the audit and the recertification each year. I think it's every year. They may have extended that, but last I heard, it was every year. 
All right, so basic through penetrations are frequently combustible. So you got plastic pipes, conduit, inner duct tubing. You know, you've got ENT, which is electrical non-metallic tubing. We run into all the time the gray conduit, uh, fiberglass insulated pipe, foam rubber insulated pipe. All these things are going to combust and melt away. Uh, what you see in that picture there is actually a wrap strip. And that wrap strip material will expand 60 times its thickness at 400 degrees. And what that's going to do is it's going to expand and collapse that pipe. It's using the, in this case, it's using the wall as the collar. It's going to expand, collapse that pipe, and seal that opening, stopping fire, smoke, and gas for the hourly duration needed. Uh, that stuff's amazing. If you ever get a chance, I, you know, I could send you guys some samples. You take a lighter to it, take a torch to it. It expands. It's really neat to see it expand along with the pillows as well. Those are those are pretty neat to see expand. Now, if you're dealing with plastic, most of the plastics are covered with intumescent sealant up to two inches. But when you get to three inch and bigger non-metallic uh, assemblies, those typically require a collar or a wrap strip or a tuck in like what you see in this picture here where they're tucking it into the wall. Do this a lot in the concrete floors as well. Um, uh, so what is fi why fire stop expansion with heat? Um, a, a quality needs a quality needed to close down openings created as combustible through penetrations burn away, leaving an opening for the passage of toxic smoke, heated gases, and fire. So when the, the heat hits this stuff, our triple S starts to go at 200 degrees and then expands again at 400 degrees. And that's what's going to expand and close these uh, melting system elements down. What we use for our intumescence is graphite. So, you, you know, the little black snakes, the little circles that you get at the 4th of July and you light them and they keep growing and growing. That's graphite mixed with an accelerant. We use that graphite or it's actually we use a higher quality graphite than the fireworks, but we use a graphite like that in our intumescent uh, caulk materials to get that expansion to, to seal that off. That's how that's how a lot of your fire stop products work. So you can kind of see it here before and after it's heated. They did brush it off. You will see a bunch of little black snakes coming out of the the, the pie piece there, um, but they brushed that off before they took the picture. So if you ever get a chance to, to, to hold a lighter to the ceiling, it's really neat to watch that go as well. It doesn't take much and it starts to expand. Um, our intumescent material is necessary. Uh, as they burn, these combustible penetrants will liberate toxic smoke and gases, provide sources of fuel to propagate the fire, create openings that compromise the fire barrier, allowing smoke or fire, sp spread of fire, toxic smoke, superheated gases in unprotected areas. So they are absolutely essential. They're really the only way to close down uh, stuff that's going to melt and burn away. Anything that's combustible, it's got, you know, the, the jacketing on that cable is going to melt away. You've got to have something that's going to stop the fire, smoke, and gas from blowing through that opening and affecting the people on the other side of that barrier. And they've got to last for one, two, three, or four hours, depending on the rating of the barrier. This kind of shows you um, the temperature curve uh, in a fire that and and when the uh, intumescent material will will go off. You'll see as well as let's see here. We've got when the when the material starts to soften, you can see where it ignites and then you can see where it starts to burn. So about 700 degrees, most of your combustible materials will start to burn. Um, that's where the intumescent really kicks in. It's already started at, at 200 and then it really kicks off when that stuff starts to burn. So the entire time it's applying pressure to that non-combustible or that combustible material and as soon as that stuff does start to completely move away that's going to expand and fill in for that area that it's that's leaving and stopping the fire smoke and gas so if you ever see a ul burn test you'll see a little poof of smoke sometimes on the cold side and that's it you won't see any more smoke nothing through that opening for that hourly duration if it's if it's a successful ul test Um, as combustible penetrants soften with the heat, intumescent fire stop material will collapse the penetrant as it burns, stop fire from spreading, form a tough smoke seal, and reduce the transmission of heat. Uh, here's a good example. This is actually one of the non-metallic pipe collars. So this is a four-inch non-metallic uh, uh, pipe collar, excuse me. And what you're seeing here is actually the same collar. So you're seeing a front and a back view of the same collar. We cut the pipe off halfway through the wall with a saw. Uh, and so keep in mind, there's a whole nother collar that still looks brand new that was on the cold side of this barrier. The hot side, as you see here, the front and the back view, you can see where the, the PVC melted, the intermessal material expanded. You've got a little knot left of the, the plastic material where they kind of mix together. And that's how you stop the fire, smoke, and gas from getting through on a non-metallic pipe like a PVC pipe, something like that. 
Um, here's another uh, good example. You've got a telephone closet. You've got some vertical cable runs. On the left, you've got some Cat5, Cat6, Cat7 cable you're starting to see now. On the right, you've got some mechanical piping or, or power cable. Um, they're usually stacked one on top of another. They have floor penetrations that make each closet, in effect, a vertical chimney. These openings are filled with plastic jacketed cables or fuel, so it's very important to seal these off. What you're seeing here is they actually mortared the holes closed. I know this is a blurry picture, unfortunately. And then they used our fire stop putty around the cables to seal it. So if they wanted to expand, they could go in and drill a hole through the fire mortar uh, and uh, and then add more cable and then take the putty and install that as well. It's nice because it's reenterable. You know, we really have moved away from any mortar systems anymore. It, today, if I was shown this, I would recommend pillows for the opening because it's a much easier install. You could do it in five minutes and it's very reenterable. You know, I might mortar the cables on the right, but I would definitely pillow the cables on the left just so you can re-enter it. Because over the life of this building, you know you're going to pull new data cables constantly. I mean, they're right now they're going to start upgrading from CAT 6 to CAT 7 is the new technology. So they're going to have to pull all those new CAT 7 cables eventually. You know, it'll be years down the road, but it'll have to happen to, to keep up with the, with the equipment that's being used, especially in healthcare. Uh, plastic jacket and cable bundles are fuel. So consider an 18 by 4 cable tray loaded with PVC jacket and cable to a maximum NEC allowable capacity. And you kind of get the idea of, of the BTUs that are going to go off on this. So is this a one foot? You got um, 18 by four. So you see your BTUs are 150,000. Same with gasoline is 135,000 and wood is only 8,000. So essentially a fully loaded cable tray can be just as bad as gasoline when you look at it. Because there's so much petroleum jacketing in those cables that that's going to go off and it's going to carry the fire right down the cable run. So cable trays are extremely, uh, unless they're all plenum rated, uh, are extremely flammable. So you've got to make sure those are sealed off more importantly than almost anything else in the building. Uh, those are typically a weak spot if they're not handled correctly where the fire will run. So who requires fire stop? So International Building Code, of course, is, is covers the United States. Um, I do cover Bermuda. They're still on the 1998 Boca Code, so they don't really, they're, they're not, they're looking at Firestop more as a liability and insurance thing than they are as a, as a, a code situation. So there I've really pushed the fire department, because which does the majority of their inspect, inspections, and the fact that the insurance really pays close attention there because there's a major firm from every insurance company. There's a building there, a branch of every major insurance company there in Bermuda, they use it as a tax shelter and, and for other reasons as well. So um, they are, ve are very paying very close attention to their buildings there on, for an insurance basis. So they do a lot of fire stopping there, but it's still nowhere near what we require here in the United States. How is fire stop tested? Um, you know, here's some of your test standards. You got ASTM E119, uh, test, method, test methods for burning materials. 263, 814, 1479, 2079 for joints, E84, that's your surface burning, and then uh, 723 is also surface burning. It's kind of some newer ones there. Um, you know, I've seen products that are just tested for E84 that aren't fire stop products. So you have to be careful just because it has some of these standards on it doesn't mean it's the right product for the job. You know, I've seen a million times where a, a UL 2079 product was put into a penetration when it was really meant for just for joints as well and we don't really look at them this way these are just the test standards you know we've got joint products we've got penetration products we make it very uh very clear on the products what they're supposed to be used for so there isn't any confusion uh here's the, the basic the temperature curve during a burn so if you got if you're doing a one hour test you max out at about 1400 degrees two hour test you can see you get up to about 1600 three hour, 2000. If you're doing a four hour burn test, you get over 2000 degrees and, and two, 2000 degrees for 240 minutes is a, a you know, it's extremely uh, uh, destructive. So it's very, very uh, important that this stuff does what it says it's going to do and is able to maintain that. If you can make it through four hours, you can definitely make it through just about anything. And, and typically a, a commercial fire, you know, if it's still burning for four hours, Everyone's evacuated the building at that point, the fire department's there and so on. So, you know, that's really the max that we've ever seen rated was four hours. Uh, when you're when you're uh, looking at the tests, 
you've got your F rating, which the F rating is your hourly rating. That's based on one, two, three, or four hours or the time that that material should be able to survive in a, in a uh, fire test. Uh, sometimes you will have a 30 minute wall. Sometimes you'll have an hour and a half barrier. In those situations, there are no 30 minute ULs. There are no hour and a half ULs typically with fire stop. So you wanna use in a 30 minute wall, you wanna use at least a one hour UL. And an hour and a half barrier, you want to use at least a two-hour UL. So those do come up sometime in condos. I've seen 30-minute uh, corridor walls and demising walls, and I've seen hour and a half walls before as well. I don't see them that often. Usually it's one or two or three or four, um, and really it's usually just one or two anymore. So that's your F rating. Uh, you also have a T rating, which uh, is the, you know, I kind of think of it as the thermal, but it's really the uh, a measure of the thermal conductivity of a fire stop system. Um, the time required for various elements of the unexposed side of the system to exceed 325 degrees above ambient, which is room temperature. So as soon as that on the on the cold side of that burn hits off above 325 degrees, that's where the T rating stops. So you don't always have to have a matching F and T rating depending on the barrier, but a lot of your floor penetrations require a matching F and T rating. So make note of that on the top of the ULs, you'll see F rating will be first. And then right under that, if the T rating applies, there'll be a T rating. And then when you get into to, uh, some systems, typically cabling, sometimes you'll even see an L rating, which is the next one here. And that's your, your air leakage. So they'd also do an air leakage test, especially around cable bundles, uh, light sockets, uh, light switches, and things like that. They all have an L rating requirement, uh, sometimes called out on the, on the plans, sometimes not. Uh, it's, it's really not a, necessarily in the codes to, to some extent. It's... Yeah. Yeah. And so my, my wife just pointed out to me that it is important in rooms with clean agent and it is required for smoke barriers. There is a, a minimum L rating requirement. So are L ratings principally used around curtain walls for air gaps? Not typically. The L ratings don't typically come up. I mean, they are called out, I think, on some curtain wall systems that I have to look to reference, but really you should have that sealed. Curtain wall should be you know, not almost hermetically sealed to, to, to a certain extent to stop that smoke from going floor to floor that, you know, they're more around, a, say, a, a cable bundle. Say sure. you've got a four inch uh, bundle of, of cat five cable. It, you know, in our ULs, you don't have to put material in between each cable to seal that. You just have to put the right amount of material all the way around the bundle, which will allow for what we call interstitial spaces between the cables. So really the only thing you should see daylight on the other side when you're when you're inspecting a fire stop uh, system would possibly be cables and that's just because you know the material will expand rapidly enough to fill in for that, that you'll get such a minimal uh, smoke leakage on the other side so you know that's really where the, the l rating plays out but uh, when it comes to fire stopping all right so how's fire stop tested so you see on the left the gypsum wallboard assembly some assorted pipes and uh insulated non-insulated plastic you've got an ac line set there which has got a pvc insulated copper, uninsulated copper, and then a metal pipe. You know, we're, that's a multi. So you've got four different materials going through the same opening. We've got a UL that, that displays that. The other ones are all single. On the right side here, you've got a, a several non-metallic uh, penetrations. The top two look like metal pipes, but they're actually ABS plastic pipes. ABS is used a lot in, on the West Coast. We use mainly PVC here on the, the East Coast, as you, as you know. So we do test everything. And so don't be misled. You never need a collar like that on a metal, steel, or cast iron pipe. Those are generally handled with intumescent sealant. Collar is, is for, your non or for your combustible stuff. So what we do then is we'll take that over. We'll drop that slab or that barrier down onto the furnace. They do it vertically if it's a wall. They do it horizontally if it's a floor. And they'll start the fire. You'll see the thermocouples on the top of the slab there. Those are going to measure for your T rating. As soon as it, it, it uh, goes above 325 degrees above room temperature, including room temperature, that's when the T rating will stop. And that's what those are measuring there. Typically, you don't want to see any fire, smoke, or gas, or anything come through that opening. Uh, at, the, at the top side, if it does, that can be a failure. UL says, thanks for your money try again later and we have to go back and, and start over from scratch again you know we, we if you go outside what the, the material can handle that does happen sometimes usually we do a pre-test before we actually have ul involved and we we know that before so we don't waste too much money on that but it does happen uh, so now they drop this down on the furnace and they start the fire so you can see on the right the smoke coming out like i said before if anything fails at this point you know one two three four hours they shut it down ul says oops you failed thanks for your money try again later if we make it through the burn, 
Here you can see we've removed it from the furnace. Now we've got four different things here. Uh, the front left is a fiberglass insulated pipe. So it's a, met, uh, a steel pipe with fiberglass insulation on it. You can see the fiberglass insulation is completely gone, melted. And what it did is it melted to the pipe. So you, when this cools off, you can take a screwdriver and scrape it up the pipe and the glass will actually crumble off the pipe. So it, it shrunk and, and uh, melted itself to the pipe and in turn shrunk rapidly, which left a hole above. So above, this was sealed with four inches of mineral wool and a five eighths inch depth of our triple S sealant. And that was enough to collapse the insulation as it heated up, seal, sealed it off and stopped the fire smoke and gas from breaking through. You can see the insulation still intact above. It was a successful test. That little black part there, it looks like a char, but it's, it's just the shadow of the picture. Uh, the pipe right behind that was just a cast iron pipe no insulation that's pretty easy to do those pipes are going to hold up you know up to four hours they're not going to melt away uh they're going to be red hot though so we do have to worry about the t rating there because it could the, the the heat can transfer through the steel but again that was four inches of mineral wool five eighths inch of triple s sealant the fire did not break through uh, over here on the right side the front you actually see a bundle that's just a copper cable is left so above it you'll see the the bundle of gray cable that's your typical uh romex and all the jacketings melted away, burned away, and all you've got left is the glowing copper there. Uh, again, it was four inches of mineral wool, five eighths inch of sealant. That was enough to seal that off, not let fire, smoke, and gas uh, break through. You can still see a little bit of the insulation where they insulate the, the wires above. You will get some residual heat that'll come around the sides of the furnace. So they do insulate a little bit above, so that doesn't affect the test essentially. And then the last one here is at the back. You'll see all that's left is a collar. Uh, that was a PVC pipe melted away fell off the collar expanded sealed that off stopped the fire smoking gas from penetrating the barrier uh, this was a two-hour test i believe so everything held up we made it through that part of the test now they're going to remove the slab fly it over and they're going to do the last part of the test and the last part of the test so here they've stood it up you see the plastic pipes have been choked off these are different slabs here uh, the top two are just metal pipes all you can see there is charred mineral wool um, on the right side here, you'll see a sheetrock wall. You've got a cable tray still burning. You can see the jacketing burning still on fire as they removed it from the furnace. You can see the sheetrock wall starting to break down. Bottom right, you've got an insulated pipe. You can see the insulation still burning. And then what they're going to do to these uh, as the last part of the test is they take a fire hose to it. So within 10 minutes of it being removed from the furnace, they take a fire hose and they spray it unbiasedly. So they'll go back and forth, back and forth, up and down, up and down. If any of the fire stop is, is dislodged around the penetra penetration whether or joint, um, that's a fail. UL says, thanks for your money, try again later. So, and this, this has nothing to do with firefighters. This is actually their way of impact testing it. So this was derived from USG testing sheetrock walls. Uh, at the end of the burn, they would take a battering ram and swing it into the wall. They had a ball they would swing into the wall. That was their way of impact testing. They found that those, those, were, those were very inconsistent. And the most consistent way to impact test was with a fire hose. So one hour is 45 seconds. A two hour is a minute 15. Three hour, I believe, is 130 or 145. And a four hour, uh, fire, the, the spray test is, I believe, two minutes. So I might have those a little off. I don't have it written down. But that's what this thing has to withstand after it's been through the two hour burn, for instance, and not in this scenario. And that's what it takes to get a successful UL test. Any questions on that? If you ever get a chance and, and hopefully, you know, once everything settles down and, and COVID's under control, uh, we do offer a FIT2 training in our corporate office, and that's the highest level of training that we offer. It's a two-day class. Uh, I could get the fee waived. It's $1,500. We I could get that waived for you. You just have to pay your way up and a couple nights stay. Um, and at the end of that, we actually do a burn test. You get to see a burn test real time. They, I think they only do it for 30 minutes. They don't do the full two hour, or one hour, but you get to see a PVC pipe, a three inch PVC pipe with a collar, one without a collar. It's pretty neat to see the, the one without the collar, smoke, smoke and fires blowing through there in about 15 minutes. The one with the collar, you never even see it break through. So it's, a, it's pretty neat. If you ever want to do that, you know, in the, in the next, in the couple, next couple of years or so, I don't know when this will all settle down uh, next year. All of our fit twos are scheduled uh, virtually right now. That may change though. So we may start having people visit the, the home office and our home office is in Somerville, New Jersey, if you're not familiar. Firestop is a headache. 
A lot of people think that, but it's really not. And it's an important that we do it. Um, there is no other code required work anywhere in construction that is installed by every trade. And I guess that's really where the headache comes from. Um, you've got people that, you know, no single trade wants to take ownership in it. Hey, he ran his conduit through my joint. I'm not responsible for it. You, know, you get that all the time. Uh, many crafts consider Firestop a necessary evil rather than a, rather than a critical element of the fire safety envelope. Um, many salespeople prey on the uneducated as well. They're selling the UL logo on the tube rather than what the product actually does and using the right product for the right solution is very important. You, if the product's cheap or, or I say less expensive, then a lot of times it's not an intimescent product it's, and it's typically more meant for joints than this for penetrations. And that would be fine around a metal pipe going through the wall, but the minute that pipe's in, got insulation on it, it's a cable bundle, it's a non-metallic pipe, now we've got a problem because that material is not gonna be able to expand to seal that off correctly. Um, while third-party testing ensures that all fire stop materials will survive, the test the test of fire, most manufacturers product, uh, product, product, produce products that will not survive the test of time. So sorry, I couldn't read that there. And what they mean there is some products will actually age out and the intumescence will, as they get older, they won't expand as they should. So you almost have to do a, a replacement of those products. The graphite prevents that. So the graphite is very moisture stable. You don't have to worry about any issues with it over the time or the life of the building. And typically you never have to redo that as long as it's not damaged or disturbed throughout the life of the building. Uh, one example is a water soluble product, like I mentioned. So here's an example of a water soluble intumescent fire stop that's actually been exposed to humidity and the intumescent material is leaching out of it. Now this product uses sodium silicate instead of graphite and what you see there is salt leaching down the pipe. So that collar is not going to expand like it would if it was brand new over time. It's it's deteriorated and it's also, you know, damaging the pipe. If that was a metal pipe, you'd have some some uh, rusting but you shouldn't have a collar on a metal pipe. So that's a CPVC pipe there. What we're looking at is a, a non-metallic pipe in a wood frame construction, which is not common here. That's more of a West Coast thing. Here, that'd be a PVC pipe typically. Here's another example of the water-soluble fire stop. You can see the sodium silicate leaching down the wall. Uh, it's actually getting onto the door jam in this scenario and rusting the door jam. Anytime you've got a lot of moisture in an area, you can have this issue. That's why when we started our company, we did go with the graphite over uh, sodium silicate. Sodium silicate was the first Firestop products, and then graphite's really changed and taken over the industry currently. You also have shrinkage. So if you're not using an intumescent product, it's very critical that it doesn't shrink. So what you see on the left here is a Firestop product that does not expand with heat. So it is the right product for, this, for the application, but it's shrunk over time. So if this was, an, or it wasn't installed correctly, that could have been as well. So this stuff, you can see it pulled away, left a little gap around there. There's no intumescence there, so you're not going to get that expansion that you would need to seal that off. Uh, even if that was an intumescent fire stop, that still would not be a correct installation. You still have to completely seal that because you're going to have cold smoke blowing through the building at the beginning of the fire before the heat gets to it. So you want to have that as sealed as possible. Um, you know, you would fail anything with a gap like that if you were inspecting something like that. And same same situation on the right here. This was a, a fire stop material that shrunk. It opened up a crack. This was painted over. That's why it's white in color. So, what are your fire stop product options? There's a million of them. So, I don't want. I didn't want to go through a, a million different products with you today. But this is just a picture. It kind of captures almost everything that we supply from our Easy Path, which are for heavy, uh, high traffic cable runs. Whether you want it, we've got five gallon buckets of intumescent sealant sausages quartz uh the, the collars sometimes you buy them factory so they're they're meant to go on a three four five six eight inch pipe sometimes you have to build them so we've got the material to build them you've got fire stop pillows you've got fire stop mortar there's a variety of fire stop products there uh pretty much to cover all different types of construction currently but you know we do see new types of construction every day so we're constantly trying to keep up with the testing uh, for that So kind of a breakdown of some of the products here, the different colors, you know, most everything we do offer in red. There's only one product we do not offer a red color currently, and that is our silicone. Uh, the silicone is a gray concrete color. That's because it's not paintable. So if it is being used in an exposed area, then you, you can't paint it. So we did it, you know, basically concrete color because that's usually where it's exposed in your precast uh, tilt up buildings 
where you don't have a ceiling in it. You've got it exposed. They don't want a bright red through all their penetration, so they go with the, the silicone. Any of our other products that aren't silicone, our LCI, our Triple S, our ES, our AS spray, all those are water-based and they are paintable once they cure. So some people go with the blue, some people will go with the red. We even offer white if you really need to paint over something or need a finished look. It's just white can be dangerous. So we don't sell it and we only sell it at, uh, per request because if an inspector gets on there, they're, they've got to believe that that's fire stop. And if it's white, it's sometimes that can cause a big problem. So definitely keep a tube of it, document what you're doing. You know, we have all the documentation to back it up, but make sure the inspector knows, hey, I'm putting white fire stop in there. That's not smoke and sound or acoustical sealant. Whites are going out here. Uh, products that cure such as sealants and mortars are designed to be installed once and left alone. So on the left, you see a small PVC pipe, just intumescent sealant. On the right, you've got a metal clad cable, intumescent sealant. Pretty basic installs, a variety of ULs for them. For, for instance, on the right, if you had a metal clad bundle, you could do up to a four inch metal clad bundle uh, or armor clad cable in a, in a six inch hole. And you can just caulk it just like that. This is just an individual one, but just for an example. If you go over that four inch bundle, and then you've got to get into a much more advanced system. It's not just going to be a clock only system. Uh, you have to separate them. You'd have to make multiple holes to get a bigger bundle than that, just for an example. Uh, here's an example of a bunch of cables. In this case, you got Cat 5, Cat 6 cables going through a wall. Again, it's not a great picture. I apologize for that. But here it's being sealed with pillows. And that's something that's very reenterable. And you're going to see a better picture of pillows in the next slide. But that's something that's re very reenterable. It can be permanent. It can be temporary. You can pull the pillows right back out, add a cable, put the pillow right back in. Very retrofitable um, and very, very aesthetically pleasing. So here's a, a good breakdown of the uh, pillows on the left. There you've got a, a steel cable tray. We've got aluminum. We've got wire basket cable tray systems. We've got ladder aluminum ladder rack cable tray systems for data. And you can see they can just you just stuff the pillows in the opening. Our pillows are in a poly bag. Inside there's a, a mineral wool uh, piece that's coated on all six sides with an intumescent coating. When the fire hits those, those bags basically melt away like shrink wrap, exposing the intumescence, which expands like crazy. Uh, if you ever get a sample of one, drop it in a campfire, it expands into a big black marshmallow, essentially. I wouldn't put it in my fireplace, but uh, in a campfire is pretty neat. And it's amazing how much these things expand. You've got to stop all that uh, flammable cabling from the fire running right through that wall like a fuse. So these have to be extremely intumescent to do that. And that's one way to do it is with pillows. You could shrink that opening down and use sealant uh, sometimes, but in this situation, you've got a big opening, you know, within, you could walk up to this opening and seal it in 10 minutes, whereas if you're going to form it off and try to pour mortar, there's a lot of other ways to do it. This is typically the most cost-effective solution for a large opening. Four On inch. the right, you see putty going in. There's a, just a standard four-inch cable bundle going through a, a six-inch hole, basically running a five-eighth inch uh, log of putty around there. You just roll it into a snake wrap it around there, tuck it into the opening. And the, the, the nice thing here is if you need to get back into that opening, you can pull the putty out. It never cures. So it always stays soft and pliable. It's never going to cure heart or harden. You can always pull it back out, add a cable, put the putty right back into the opening. So that's a great reinterval. That's your most basic reinterval product. A more advanced one would be the pillows. Hey, Jay. Yeah. Uh, what keeps those pillows in place? Our pillows are just held in with compression. So you've got to put them in with a 1.4 compression factor. So they're basically squeezing themselves in the opening. Now, if you do get to a larger opening and you don't have a lot of penetrance in there, sometimes they do need to be retained with, with uh, wire mesh, excuse me, on each side or strapping. Uh, but typically in most of your pillow applications, they're just, they hold themselves in the opening just with compression. Just like mineral wool wood in a floor to floor joint. If you, you know, you compress it into the floor to floor joint, uh, caulk or spray the top, it's not going to slip out over time and fall out. It's the same principle as, as how the pillows work. The nice thing is if you need to add a cable, you can just pull one or two pillows out, put your new cable through, slide your pillows right back in and keep on going. So they're very reenterable. Uh, here's a steel sleeve. Uh, one of these, I see these all the time and these actually get mishandled quite a bit where you'll see them sheetrock mud the sleeve into the barrier then run the cables through and install the fire stop in the sleeve. You do have to keep in mind on these sleeves if you're inspecting them uh, is make sure the outside is sealed just as importantly as the inside. And sleeves, you have to understand, they are not required by fire and for any fire stop reason. 
they're typically spec driven as well. The spec will say all penetrations are to be sleeve and it'll even describe what kind of sleeve. We could do a bundle of cables with the sleeve or without the sleeve. You just have to keep in mind if you do have the sleeve, make sure that outside that sleeve is sealed. It can't be sheetrock mud. You, you know, that sheetrock mud is going to break down in a fire. You're going to have smoke and gas getting around the sleeve. And then, of, of course, you really need the inside sealed as well because that's where all your combustibles are in this scenario. And you can do that with putty or pillows as well. Uh, steel sleeves not required uh, by model or regional building codes. However, uh, they may facilitate the installation of the cables as well as the fire stop system. So we've really gone away from sleeves in all of our testing like I described before. We typically offer a sleeve or unsleeved uh, solution. So it's really spec driven at this point. Um, there's some advantages, some disadvantages to the sleeves, but I think you guys pretty much know those. Um, if you got a hollow wall, that's an advantage. If you don't, disadvantage. Really, the sleeves create two seals, where if you don't have the sleeve, you've only got to worry about one seal on, the, on each side of the wall. Uh, products that can be removed and replaced. So you also have the, the, uh, the need for labels sometimes. Now, again, this is not something that's in the code. It's another thing that's spec driven, but a lot of facilities, especially in healthcare, do want their, their penetrations labeled. So this is an example of a label you can get from us. Uh, they come with our easy path devices. Some of the, of the Firestop installers actually make their own labels. That way they've got their name and, and all that stuff printed on there uh, already. It makes it easier to fill out and it's an advertisement for their company as well. Plus it's, hey, we did this, not the other guy you brought in here last year, the guy that was here two years ago that did a terrible job. You know, here we did a good job. So labels, again, they're not always required, but it's it's a spec driven thing. Um, but they, we definitely recommend in high traffic openings should be labeled such to alert future trades not to tamper with them. Uh, fire stop without or fire stop without proper authorization. This label here gives you a line to put the product installed, the date, who did it, your phone number. And most importantly, the last one is what UL system did you use? If an inspector is looking at this thing, say, OK, they use this UL. They could go to the phone app. They could go to UL's website if they're doing it that way. They can look up that UL system, uh, no matter which manufacturer it is, and make sure that that UL system matches the install that's, that that label's uh, referencing. So I recommend them in some scenarios. You know, healthcare, they're they're pretty big, but I wouldn't put them in a, an office building, so to speak, except for maybe in your high traffic openings. And if you're using our easy path or something like that, they come with a label, one for each side of the wall. Uh, if you're doing anything else, you've got to buy these. They used to come on a roll. Now they come in a packet of 100. They're 20 cents a piece or something in that range. And again, there's no requirement on the label. You can actually make them yourself. Some specs will call out a vinyl label. We have those as well. Some specs will require you to staple the label to the wall. Most of them, they'll let the adhesives go, but I've seen them where it has to be vinyl and has to be stapled to the wall. And you're always like, well, how do you do it to your block walls? And they want you to shoot those and you're like, wow. So I haven't seen that. That was something I'd seen more in my early days. I've been doing this for 15 years. So five, uh, 10 years ago, I'd saw that a lot more. Now, typically they're just the self-adhesive labels like you see here in the picture. How, how well do those last, those self-adhesive labels? We've, I've this seen a lot of issues where they just fall off the wall and you're not sure where they go. Yeah, ours are pretty good. You know, we I've seen that too. They, they're supposed to last the life of the building or essentially the life of that penetration. So I've seen them pretty old. Uh, you know, if, it, if it's a dusty environment, you're sticking it up on a dusty sheetrock wall, of course it's not going to last as long and it's going to fall off. You know, you want to make sure the wall's clean before you install it. If you're really worried about it, that's where you pop a staple in it if it's a sheetrock wall. Uh, maybe even some adhesive if it's a block wall or something like that. And we do offer a vinyl label that would last pretty much forever. Because uh, it's just made out of a solid vinyl, almost like a really like a, a file folder piece, a plastic file folder or something like that. It's it's a real sturdy label where these are just your typical. You could tear these, those vinyl labels, you can't tear them. So they'll last a long time. I've seen them up there. You know, one job was a, they overdid it. I do have one scenario where they overdid the, the labels. I mean, you pop a ceiling tile and it looked like they wallpapered the wall with penetration labels. So they kind of overdid it in that scenario, but most of the time you put one under each penetration cleanly and they don't, you know, they, I've seen them last forever or, or the life of the building typically, but you do want to make sure you're not sticking them on dusty surfaces because they will fall right off. All right, here is multiple penetrations. Now this is a little bit of a dated uh, penetration because mortar has really gone away. But in this scenario, you've got fiberglass insulated steel, 
You got foam rubber, your ABPVC or Armaflex, as a lot of people refer to it in the middle. And then you've got a bear pipe at the end. They mortared this with a fire stop mortar. So keep in mind, this is not non-shrink grout. There is no ULs for non-shrink grouts. You can't use that as fire stop. I had a guy that they had a bunch of holes in the wrong place and he non-shrink grouted them all sealed. The inspector asked him, hey, which UL did you use? He didn't have one. So he actually had to put our composite sheet at the bottom of that floor so we could give him a UL to, to rate all those penetrations that he had, or those blank openings that he had filled with uh, non-shrink grout. So if he had just called me, we could use this mortar and he wouldn't have had any worries and, and wouldn't have to do it twice, essentially. So what they did here on the on the combustibles, they wrapped it with a wrap strip, then installed the, the mortar. And you're going to see after the burn below here. So this is really a good uh, representation of what the wrap strip does. You can see where it's expanded 60 times its thickness. You can see the mortar underneath is cracked a little bit, but above it's still perfectly intact. It doesn't shrink. It doesn't fall out as it's, as it, as it's going through a burn in this scenario here. So that really shows the intumescence. The far right was the was the bare pipe. It didn't need a wrap strip. The two in the middle there, are left and middle, are the ones that had the combustible insulation on them. You can see where the insulation burned off the pipes and there's just the wrap strip and the mortar that was securing the wrap strip in the opening there. Today, we would typically do that a little different, um, but that's a good example of the wrap strip activating. Also, you'll run into cable spray. Um, this is something you see a lot in the industrial industry where you've got unrated or unplenum rated cables and you're trying to get them plenum. Uh, there, we do have a spray that we offer that you can actually spray the cables. It's not rating the cables, but it's slowing down the surface burning characteristics of it. You still have to fire stop it as they go through the opening. Uh, that is something that we do sell quite a bit of. We sell more of it internationally than we do here in the, in the States. But as we get more and more in industrial, I'm seeing it a lot in this area and starting to sell, sell quite a bit. So something that we didn't see a lot of at all, and it's really starting to pop up lately. So installing Firestop. Sadly, Firestop is frequently misinstalled. Um, installing Firestop is not rocket science, or I call it rocket surgery, but it is more than just smearing on the expensive red goop with, with the UL on the tube. So this is kind of hard to see, but it's just a really bad job. There's material all spread all over. Uh, nothing's really in the opening. It's all outside the barrier. So they didn't open up the barrier or open up the opening. There was some, the grout was basically in there. They needed to chip that out to get the proper fire stop in the opening to do it correctly. You definitely don't want to do that. You can't just surface caulk. You've got to get it in the barrier for it to work correctly. A typical install here, you'll see packing. So if, if it does require mineral wool, you're going to pack the full depth of the barrier with mineral wool, recessing the mineral wool on each side, the depth of the sealant required. In this case, they're using an intumescent sealant. You could use a non-intumescent here, but generally when you're doing penetrations, we recommend an intumescent for everything. That way you don't make a mistake. If you're a plumber and you're moving along, this is a conduit, but it, so if you're an electrician, if you're moving along, you, you caulk a conduit, you're great. Then you get to a cable bundle, you caulk it as well, you're good to go. If you were using that non-intumescent, you're gonna have to switch products. You're gonna go intumescent on the, on the metallic, then you have to switch back to the intumescent product on the non-metallic stuff. And that's where we've seen big problems arise. So generally electrician will just use intumescent for everything. Plumber will just use intumescent for everything. Drywall guy, mason guy, waterproofer, they'll use non-intumescent for all of their joints. It's typically how it goes down. So now you'll install the sealant into the opening. If this one's a, this one was a 5 8 inch depth of material in the opening, and the last step is to always tool it. You've got to touch that material again to install it correctly. There's no way to get all the air out of there. There's no way to smooth it correctly without touching it again. You don't typically use a trowel like this picture. You want to use a putty knife. I usually use my finger. I'm not doing it every day, so I know if I did it every day, it would probably wear a hole in my finger, but a putty knife works great. A lot of the installers go to uh, Walmart or Target. They go to the cake decorating section. They get the cake decorating spatulas. Those work really well. Lots of different shapes. You, you, there's no excuse to not tool that material. It has to be smoothed out. You don't want a big red circle. That's a red flag. I mean, if I'm inspecting a project and I see a giant circle around a pipe, I'm going to know, hey, there's, they probably don't know what they're doing. They're wasting a bunch of product. They're just smearing, smearing it all over the wall. You know, they shouldn't be cleaning their putty knives off on the conduit, seeing red intumescent material all over the, the conduit as well. I've got thousands of pictures that represent those issues, and usually they don't know what they're doing when it comes to fire stop. They are just a trunk slammer that, hey, it's red. we got to put it around this pipe to pass and hope the inspector doesn't catch this kind of situation. So I'm always paying attention for those things. But this is a typical pack and caulking install. 
A uh, couple more installations here. You got a floor penetrations generally require only a seal on one side. So when you are inspecting or looking at floor penetrations, most of your ULs, you only need to seal the top. Now we do have a lot of options for just installing the bottom as well. You don't have to do anything at the top. You just install the bottom or we have a lot of ULs where you just install the top. The only time on a floor that you would have to do the top and the bottom is if you do have a hollow core uh, floor. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Hollow core floors have hollow uh, opening or hollow uh, spaces in them for structural to make them more more uh, rigid. And what can happen is the smoke can travel into that hollow core, travel under a fire rated wall, and then pop up through another penetration on the other side of that fire rated wall. So really the only time you have to have actually have to seal the top and the bottom is a hollow core floor. Every other type you can do the top or the bottom. Uh, we, gen we generally offer the bottom installs for in healthcare again. You've got a, uh, you're doing a remodel of the, the second floor. You, you don't have access to the third floor because it's occupied, but you still got to seal these penetrations. So we give you the option to just seal it from the bottom, not actually have to go to the top. And then when you're dealing with wall penetrations, you generally have to seal both sides. So one, one seal for floors, two seals for walls generally. Uh, and then when you get into shaft walls where you only have access to one side, we have solutions for that. Typically there's til still two seals and or you've got to put a sleeve in to represent that extra seal and install some extra material. So if you do run the shaft walls, I can give you all of our shaft wall systems as well. Um, you Those typically need to be fire stopped as they're building them. So they'll put the shaft liner up, caulk that, then install your two layers of five eights, caulk that, and, you're, and you've got your, your UL system. A lot of times that gets missed. The guys call me saying, hey, we forgot to caulk the shaft liner. What do we do? We have solutions for that as well. It's a little more involved than just caulking and caulking. You got to put a sleeve in in those scenarios. Uh, when you're looking at fire stopping and, and the UL systems, annular space is a is a big factor. You know, when you're dealing with something that's got point of contact, like the top left here, uh, excessive annular space can be an issue. The first ULs, everything was centered, and then you've also got where you're dealing with the regular openings. We've got a lot of ULs that represent square openings, not that would definitely you know would represent a, a, a jagged opening, but as long as that jagged opening is smaller than the max size of that opening in the UL, then you can typically use that UL for that irregular opening. You also have group penetrations, whether they're individually grouped or where you've gone through the same opening. We've got a, a for instance, we've got a gang of conduit that can go through a sheetrock wall that's, that allows for a 36 inch wide slot. The minute you go to 37 inches, now you've exceeded the best UL for that gang of conduit. And, and I'll, I'll walk on a job the other day and the guy had an eight foot slot with conduit going through it. He's like, I need a UL for this. I said, well, you don't have a UL for this. If you'd have just done two or three, three foot uh, gangs, left sheetrock in between each of them, whether it be an inch or so, then you could have used our UL system. Now we've got to do, and what we did for him was we did an engineer judgment based off of that UL system. Uh, here's a side view of a cable bundle, so you'll actually seal the, the install of the, the outside of the sleeve as well as the inside of the sleeve, and you'll see the cable bundle there. It is okay if the cable bundle is touching. In this case, it's touching the bottom. That's okay. We know you're not going to get material in there, but you've got to get it seven-eighths of the way around that bundle, the top side, to install that correctly. And it, it's This is written the best graphic to really lay out everything that's required in a cable bundle and how to install that putty. I'd really need to show you in a UL, but that's the gist of it. Common mistake within a single system uh, is different manufacturers' products may not be mixed. So if you are in a facility and a, and you've got, say you've got STI fire stop on one side of the wall and you've got another manufacturer's fire stop on the other side of the wall in the same penetration. So you got a metal pipe going through the wall, you put STI on one side, you put a different fire stop manufacturer on the other side, you can't do that. And you especially can't put them on top of each other. Because my UL isn't going to say STI on one side, somebody else on the other, and their UL isn't going to say STI on the other side of theirs. And, and we, we actually can't put that in writing either. So if you've got one product on one side, you want to make sure you use the same product on the other side. You could use two of our different types of products. So you could use a LCI on one side, triple S on the other, and we could put that in writing. But most of the ULs are going to be the same products. So you want to really keep that consistent. Anytime an inspector sees that, they're going to say, hey, you got two different things. What is that? And then they're going to be asking questions. And they're going to want documentation, which is a good thing. And that's what we want. But, you know, it's just another a chance for a red flag there if you do if you do mix them, um, especially don't want to put them on top of each other. I've seen that a bunch of times where you've got a red material and then a 
blue material on top of that, that's a big red flag, and, and there's no UL to back that up for sure. Uh, cable tray here, so you can see hourly rating, type of construction, size of the tray. In this case, you've got the pillows installed. Note all the cabling is going to melt away on the one side. The pillows are going to stop the, the progression of the fire. Um, when you, If you were calling or looking for a UL system for this, these are the items that you would need to know. You know, First of all, what's the barrier? What's the hourly rating of the barrier? And then what's the size of your tray? What's the type of the tray, size of opening? What's your percentage of cable, configuration of cable, type and size if there are any conduits? And then is there any interduct or not? Interduct is a tricky one. That's typically fiber optics. And really, it's a lot of air you're trying to collapse. Interduct is not in every UL system that cabling is. So you really, if you do have interduct, you want to make sure there's only a specific batch of systems that allow for interduct, and you want to make sure you're using those. Your standard CAT5, CAT6 systems don't incorporate interduct typically. Uh, different size of the pillows. So it's just basically the way to calculate the pillow sizes or the, the, the amount of pillows you would need for the opening. We actually have a pillow calculator on the website that I would recommend if you are trying to figure out pillows, or just give me a call. I can do it for you and or, and or teach you how to do it. It's pretty easy. And this is the formulas. It's a 1.4 compression factor. You'll see that there in number three. So you just have to, whatever your size of your opening is, you multiply that times 1.4, and then you divide it into whatever size pillow. So if you're using the 18, 18 square inch pillow, you divide 18 into whatever your answer was there, and it, that would be say, okay, I need 36 pillows in that opening, and I'll meet the UL system. That's how you figure out pillows. And here's some orientation of it. You always typically want to go vertically so you can get the get back into and add cables down the road. You'll see at the bottom they went horizontal. That's perfectly fine. Not as easy to add cables when they're horizontal. So when you're when you are installing them around a cable tray, this is typically the the what we recommend when you're packing them in there. This is where they actually shrunk the opening with mortar and then installed the, the pillows. That's another way to do it. Um, most people these days just put pillows in the entire opening, to be honest. Because by the time you do all that mortar, it can really add up as far as labor because uh, it takes you a couple days to get that mortar done and, and cured. You got to build a form, then take the form off and then pack the pillows. So a lot of times they just pillow the entire opening. Now we've done we've done a doorway full of pillows burned for four hours. Nothing passed through it. Just for an example, I've done entire. We had a, a hospital where the you pop the, the, the ceiling tile and the wall didn't go all the way up to the deck. It was it was 12 feet by four feet high. They installed pillows in the entire uh, area. It had all different types of penetrations going through it, and we did a, an EJ for that. They did have to use the wire mesh in that scenario, but it was a it was a project that if they'd have used drywall, it would have taken them two weeks. They did that over in a weekend. They had eight of those situations, and they did it over the weekend uh, with the pillows. So it was a much more cost effective solution when you when you looked at the labor and the time and shutting down the facility and creating negative air pressure. They were able to do it in a weekend. So. Pillows can really be a cost-effective solution. System selection. Um, there are three kinds of systems. You got typical, unusual, and underwriter required. Uh, typical, those are those for which a third-party tested system exists and a UL system drawing will suffice. Unusual, those are unique conditions that require an engineer judgment. So if a UL doesn't exist, we can do an engineer judgment for you that's free. We typically turn them around in 24 hours. So if you're using an STI product, we can do the engineer judgment for you. Just call me or you can call our 1-800 our number, hit two, and you're talking to an engineer, and they can walk you through it. We also have a way to digitally do it on our website. You can submit them. It's really nice. Our, our website, will you can submit an EJ. They'll email it to you within 24 hours, the, the uh, results. Sometimes they may reach out to you for questions. They'll email you or call you, depending on how you submitted it. Um, so it's, it's really a great process these days. Uh, underwriter required as well. Sometimes you will have to go beyond what we can do as a manufacturer and you have to have a third party uh, involved. So that's where an EJ would typically need to be stamped and or you've got your underwriter underwriter requirements where it's insurance company like FM uh, would have to would have to be involved in that. You typically only see that in industrial stuff. I don't see that in commercial construction or healthcare, things like that typically. How to find and use Firestop Systems drawings. 
So I, I pretty much told you how you, our website's really the best uh, and or download the app on your phone. Uh, we can definitely walk through that at some point. I know we're getting, I think we're past the hour. So I'm trying to wrap this up as quick as possible. Um, we can go through that at some point, but it's very easy. If you just, you can actually don't even need to download the app. Just go to our website, stifirestop.com. System search is in the top right. Click on that and it'll take you right through. You can find the ULs uh, uh, very quickly. You can sort through any joint curtain wall penetration system you might need. It's a pretty easy system. It's easier than using the UL website at this point. And then, of, of course, I did explain engineer judgments already. Uh, those are done by free. If a typical system does, if your if your as built construction is beyond what uh, any UL in existence can can handle, then we we can do an engineer judgment that, and we basically take the information out of the tested systems and apply them to your application to try to get as close as we possibly can. And, and we will only write them if we know that they're going to work based on other testing. We're not going to write an engineer judgment for everything. Sometimes it might require you to change the as belt condition, maybe shrink the hole down, maybe less penetrations through that opening. Just depends because I, you know, there's been times where I submit something and I don't get the judgment, but I can always get a solution in the end. We just sometimes have to alter the application. And one thing, if you're not familiar with the with Mecklenburg County, and it is trickling down into South Carolina, if you've worked on any schools, engineer judgments are sometimes not accepted from the manufacturer. So you'll get an EJ done by the manufacturer. Then the inspector comes, he says, I want that stamped. And when he says he wants that stamp, that's not by the manufacturer. That's by the third party, by a third party. So you'd have to get a North Carolina, if you're in North Carolina, South Carolina, if you're in South Carolina, fire protection engineer to stamp that. Uh, there's a firm up here we use gar engineering they do a lot of the stamps for mecklenburg county just for an example they've done some of the south carolina work too so i don't know if any of you guys are involved in that uh it is it is needed quite a bit if anybody does ej stamping you don't stamp our ej directly that's not correct you would take our ej put it onto your own uh, letterhead change it if you'd like to add to it if you'd like to you know this it becomes yours at this point and then you you would stamp it and submit it that way um but I don't know if any of you guys are involved in that, but if you need any sources for that or ever need a stamp, uh, engineer judgment stamp, you know, you can definitely contact me. I've got contacts. We have nothing to do with it. I just know people that can do it, that are respected in the industry that are typically approved. Underwriter Laboratories, you've got FM systems as well. Uh, Underwriter Laboratories is FM approved. They do have a batch of FM systems like I talked about before. And then last section here is fiction versus fact. So Firestop caulk must be red. There's actually nowhere in the building Firestop has to be red. We, we make a red version of almost everything, except for, like I said before, the silicone. But it, you know, and it, depending on the jurisdiction, some jurisdictions it better be red or, or it's not considered Firestop, but that is not in the building code. That'd just be authority having jurisdiction in that area might have a problem with it. Uh, you know, like I said, we've even got white if you need it. Is polyurethane foam Firestop? It's absolutely, it's not. Now you are you do see one of the most misused products is fire block foam. You can go to Lowe's or Home Depot. We have a fire block foam. That is to meet a residential building code for draft stopping. It is not a fire stop product. It does not have an hourly rating. It's just got a surface burning characteristic uh, uh, that it requirement, and it's just for your blocking and your fire draft stopping. And it's only for single family residential construction. You know I've walked on uh, huge apartment jobs, wood frame apartment jobs, and they've got spray foam everywhere. The inspector rakes them over the coals. They have to rip all of that out and reinstall the, a correct fire stop material with the correct ratings. So foam is typically bad. There are a couple foams uh, that are fire stop, but they're not polyurethane. They're they're a hybrid foam. Uh, we don't offer one, but a couple other fire stop manufacturers do have them. They're very expensive. We do have one, but it's a two bucket solution. It's a thousand bucks for two buckets. And it's a 50 50 mix you pour a, a gallon into the other gallon and it expands uh i forget what the expansion is but it's it's basically using the the deck of an aircraft carrier just for an example it's not something we use in general construction uh in the industry i've, I've sold it on a military base once in my 15-year career with sti uh fire tape drywall mud that's definitely not fire stop so up until a certain point, it could be used in joints as a, uh, a seal, but that's gone. That was after 1999, that was removed. So even in joints, it's not allowed. It's especially not ar allowed around uh, penetrations. Now, the only thing that does still apply is it is good 
or considered a cold smoke seal. If the wall's unrated, just requires a cold smoke seal, then drywall mud can be used. We don't recommend it because over time it will crack and crumble out of there and then smoke will be able to get through that opening. So most of your healthcare facilities, they won't allow drywall mud even in their cold smoke seal walls. They still require it. We have a smoke and sound caulk and a smoke and sound spray. There's hundreds of of manufacturers that have a smoke and sound product, USG and so on, just to name a, just to name another one. Uh, and this was just supporting that. Tape doesn't work, drywall mud doesn't work. Concrete mortar is is fire stop. It is not. I, I explained that before. You know, especially in this picture on the left here, it's not going to seal three PVC pipes as they melt away. So, and, and there is no ULs currently for non-shrink grout. So you can never use grout. If you are going to patch a hole and you can use the concrete that the building was built out of and the proper supporting methods, that is acceptable if you do it correctly. But grout does not count. Grout is ne has no ULs associated with it and shouldn't be used as a fire stop. Uh, fire safety is an adequate fire stop. We know that's not true. Uh, smoke blows through that just like a cigarette. It, the smoke's going to blow through it like a cigarette filter, but it's still going to kill you on the other side. So you've got to have something so that what the mineral wool will do is it will help to slow down the exposure of the fire stop sealant. For instance, in this scenario, if you did have fire stop sealant on the top side, it's going to slow down the progression of that heat so it doesn't affect the fire stop right away. So mineral wool is essential in a lot of fire stop systems, but you can't just use mineral wool or any other type of safing or insulation to and it be considered fire stop. It's just going to, the smoke can blow right through that stuff. That wraps it all up. I hope I didn't run over too bad there when we got 715. I don't know if we started right at six, but I really appreciate everybody's time. Uh, I forgot to put the slide in here with my contact information. I can send an email. I, I know you guys uh, have got my contact info, so if you want to send an email to everybody, that would be great. But use me as a resource. I've been doing this for 15 years. I love it. I don't see myself doing anything else unless they kick me out at some point. Uh, if you need, use me as a resource. That's all I can say. I can help you find the ULs. We even do the, we can put the ULs and shrink them down so you can put them on the plans. We've got the the, the tile charts, uh, tile tables, so you can put them on the plans. We can build them exactly for the project that you're working on. So it's just the ULs that you need, or I can give you a bunch of common ULs and you can use them at, at, your, will, uh, at your will as well. So appreciate the time. And any questions, comments, or concerns? Try to get back to the picture here. Do I unshare screen or have I already done that? Yep, no, we, we can still see your screen there. All right, I think I unshared it. You're no longer sharing. All right. Now I can bring it back up if you guys want me to show you anything else. And does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Um, you mentioned when you were talking about the different ratings, uh, T and uh, L ratings, F ratings. You didn't mention some of the others like W, and there's some newer ones out now. Could you go over that real quick? Uh, yeah, the W is, and the reason I didn't mention W is it's just not, it. W is your watertight rating. And if you're in Miami, Florida, it's a big deal. And, and Or if you're in Bermuda, it's a big deal there. So if you are looking for a W rating, the only sealant that will typically give you that is a silicone uh, sealant. So that's where you'd have to use our, our Firestop silicone. It ha It's the, we can, our intumescent sealants will actually get a W rating in the test, but since they are water-based material, they do not, they cannot be used for W rating, even though they will not break down with water, just like some of the other manufacturers will break down with water. But in, for a W rating, you would need our silicone sealant, just for an example. Um, I'm not, I can't remember the other ones. I don't have it in front of me, unfortunately. Is there any other ratings you're thinking of? Um, I've been out of the business for a year now, so I can't remember what they are, but there's some newer ones out there. Yeah, there are. It, L's really come back into the forefront uh, with your, your leakage around uh, electrical outlets, uh, cable bundles and things like that. But it's and it, it does have a, a reference in the code now and it, it is actually stated firmly on top of the UL. So if you do have a specific L rating minimum, then make sure your UL has that reaches that minimum or, or the L rating is below what the maximum is allowed for that specification for instance and what i can do is i can follow up on that question and get you we've got a, a uh, on our website we actually have all those ratings explained so i can send you the link to that if you want me to do that the other thing is when you're talking about the pillows um the experience i've had is quite often they don't get put back 
you find them laying on top of the cable tray and nobody ever puts them back. Yep. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Now I've had, I popped the ceiling tile, had the pillows laying there. I popped a ceiling tile, had the putty roll and hit me in the head. Um, I've had about everything that could happen there. So unfortunately, if, if you're, if you are worried about them not getting put back, then you may want to use the uh, wire mesh, you know, that could be recommended to keep them there. So somebody doesn't rip them out. We do have, a, are you familiar with our easy path device? Let's see if I can share. Yes, yes, we use that. Okay. So do I just do screen number one? Will that work? Can you see what I'm doing here? Yep, we, we can see your browser. Yep. All right. Beautiful, beautiful. Good, good. So instead of making a giant hole at your cable tray, so typically what you would do, and I, hopefully I'll get to a beautiful picture that will really show you what I'm talking about. Here's a good one. Um, so instead of running the cable tray through the wall, we could recommend it if you're worried about that, is you stop the cable tray at the wall and then you install something like an easy path device. And the nice thing about the easy path device is once they're installed, they can be completely empty completely full as you'll see an example here the cross section as you put the cable in it automatically opens and closes so you can add cable through this thing until it's completely full it has a hundred percent visual fill so you kind of get the idea as i scroll up here and there's a gang of them right there so those are great uh solutions so you don't have to worry they kind of idiot proof the cable runs so that you don't have to worry about the putty being left out or the pillows being left out like you described before we you just know. updated our website website see there's a good example there where they're running through the wall then down through the floor do those come in different uh, how how wide or how big can you do those well the, there's two we have four, three different sizes so there's the 44 33 and the 22 okay. the 44 you can do five wide uh i believe we have a, a 10 gang at this point for the wall and we can do a 16 gang for the floor and one big square and all those accessories to install at the floor, we call it the grid system. Then we have a 10 for the wall. And then for the 33, you can do seven wide. And we have big, huge grid systems for the floor of those as well. I'm trying to see if anything shows up here on the website. But So here's the three different sizes. You see the 22 on the left, 33, and the 44. And then we also have the retro device that can go over existing cable bundles that, you know, that are coming out of sleeves and or the wall, just for an example. But we've got... Just to show you, let's see if we can get there quickly. So the 44, for instance. Huh. Let me change this. Let me go back. Uh, here's a, a new uh, wide one that we have. So this would be the widest easy path. This just came out. And you can see this will actually go over an existing cable tray and can completely seal that off without removing the cable tray or any of the cables. So that's another way to do it. But so we've got a really wide one. I don't know what the dimensions are on this right off the top of my head. So it looks like it is, you can get it either 12 or 18 inches wide. And it's got to have a little bit of fill. So 25 up to 100% cable fill just for, our, you know, this is one example of a newer product. It's trying to find the, the grid system. Now, we just updated our website, so I don't know it like I should, unfortunately. It should get us there. I was just on there, and it had everything laid out for the 44. And it just keeps popping up with that. <laughs> That's odd. When I used to hit more information, it would lay out every item for the 44. But it's just giving me this really condensed page. It doesn't have nearly what I'd what I'd like to uh, see here. You know, here's the multi-wall grid system, so you can actually put ten in the wall. You see the box there. Yep. That's an example. So we've got we can make these gigantic uh, for and definitely handle any type of cabling capacity. You could put this in, then leave a little bit of drywall, put another one above it, put another one above it, and keep going. It's uh, pretty spectacular and these 
these are really the standard of the industry and all your healthcare solution uh, situations, all your big healthcare facilities are starting to use these. Uh, our competitors have tried to, to copy them, but they just really can't come close. There's usually a foam plug required or you have to twist them. So the, the real advantage here is you don't have to do anything. You just push the cables through and keep on going. And these will cover your, we've got one to four hour ratings and they, they've got all your L ratings covered as well. So you're seeing quite a bit of these in like data centers and those types of locations? Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. We've been, we're now, uh, I want to say Facebook is all all easy path now. They tried to use the competitors and it was a, it was a failure. So they've switched to ours. Uh, all the Atrium Health, for instance, any any cable bundle, they have to, they require the easy path device. Okay. Just for an ex all the Atrium facilities. Used to be Carolina's Medical. Uh, what's what? What did uh, oh, Greenville Healthcare Prisma is all STI? They use EasyPath exclusively for all their cable runs as well. You know, this isn't something that you want to put conduit through. This isn't something you want to put uh, metal clad cable. It'll take conduit. It'll take metal clad cable, but that's a waste. Put that through the wall, caulk it. This is for your high traffic voice data, low voltage stuff that's constantly getting updated throughout the life of the building. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Maybe this is what this is the page I was looking for. All right. So a little more, a little more here. You can see the 44. There's split plates, multi-wall gang. There's the five gang. There's the 10 gang. So you could put one in here or you could put 10. A little bit wider. And as we get down here, you'll see we've even got a vertical solution. Uh, extensions. So I, I had a wall that was uh, 30 inches thick, so they actually had to add extensions to make the easy path stick out of both sides of the wall. These are six inches. You just keep adding them until you get to your desired width. Radius control module. Here's the floor plate. It's a split plate. You can So these devices do come apart if you want to retro them. And then, of course, here's the grid systems at the bottom. You can do four, eight. There's 16 in the floor right there. So, you know, we've got these in Bank of America Tower in downtown Charlotte. A lot of your big banking centers, they put these in the towers, not in your just your small banks. Um, anywhere you've got huge cable runs, these are really come in handy. And you can actually buy it, buy them individually. So you can buy the, the cover plate you see there on the right, and then you could just put four in. You could just put eight in and then leave the other two covered until five years down the road where you want, need to add more cable. And then you can buy the, the four gang and, and continue your expansion with that. If you need your T rating, you'll see right there, that picture right there where my mouse is. If you're looking for that T rating, there's the insulation so you can get the T rating as well above the floor, the T kit. So we pretty much got everything covered. That really isn't getting forced here, the T rating as much as it is on the West Coast. And then of course the retro is really neat. Uh, this is something we just came up with. You've got overfilled sleeves and this thing just clamps onto the end of the conduit and you're good to go. You don't have to do anything else to it. It can also be bolted to the wall if the conduit's not sticking out or if there is no condo, it works for that as well. And this just launched, which I, you saw a picture of that before, where it retrofits over an existing cable tray. Uh, these here aren't fire rated. These are just for cold smoke seals or smoke walls, but they give, the, give you the ability to, to constantly pull cables back and forth through or add cables without having to make a hole. Kind of idiot proofs the hole so the guy's not leaving the putty out or, or whatever they may be using in that scenario. They come apart as well. This one's cool. This one actually goes in the, for a ceiling tile. So they bolt that to the wall with a piece of strut. They cut the square out in the ceiling tile and they can run cables up. I can't tell how many ceiling tiles I've seen where the cables run up and then they've got just putty or caulk around them. So that's kind of a something they came up with. And that pretty much covers that. Anything else you want me to go over? There's a, a wall repair kit. If the guy took a hammer and blasted a hole in the wall and you've got to seal that bundle of cables the easy path comes apart goes over the cables and then the wall plate comes apart as you can see there there's a big intumescent gasket behind it you just screw it to the wall no caulk required and you're good to go anything else i missed here's the system search if, if you guys want to see it real quick so if you saw where I went there, I, I went a little quick. So go to the top of the page, uh, Firestop system. 
click on that and this is the system search this will look just like the app that you would download for your phone so let's say we wanted to find a cable tray so i'll go penetration barrier now sometimes you want to get real specific sometimes you want to you want to you don't want to click too many things sometimes so i'm going to go walls let's do a gypsum wall we'll go to penetrant and we're going to say cable tray. So we're down to 13 systems with what I selected. Now, the big key to this is see these two buttons? Always make sure you click that one. It took me six months to find those buttons. Nobody told me about them, but it turns it into a picture. Makes it a lot faster to find the UL system. So you can see this first system is actually just a caulk system. Here's a composite sheet system, pillow system, another pillow system. You know, depending on how you're trying cable trays we've got a lot of different options there so 8026 is a is a big multi-system that's just mineral wool and sealant just to give you a quick uh example of a ul this is a one or two hour this can have a hole up to 32 by 32 inches and it's got a little bit of everything metallic pipe insulated pipe cables uh air duct bus duct a non-metallic small non-metallic two inch pvc or smaller uh, fiberglass insulated pipe cable bundles and so on and it's just mineral wool and five eighths inch i believe it's five eighths it's actually a half inch you'll see right there a half inch of our triple s or our lci sealant on each side of the wall now the only kicker to this one it's a gyp wall is you would have to frame it so you're going to have your studs on the left and the right but you'd have to add a stud at the top you can see it barely there in the in the the DK on uh, the document there. You can see the stud there, so they would have to go. You, you would have to put a horizontal stud at the top and the bottom, pack it with mineral wool, and then install the mineral uh, the sealant on each side. That's as, it doesn't get much more cost effective than that. Problem with that is it's not reenterable. It's very, I mean, it is, but you got to dig the sealant out to get back into it. So that's where you'd want to go to a more, uh, you know, a pillow system, for example, like here's uh, WL4029. And this so is showing about 730. A, uh, we should probably start wrapping it up. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, yeah, you're good. You're good. I'm good. So but if anybody's got that. any additional questions, just feel free to reach out to me. And I, I really appreciate the time today. You got it. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was very helpful uh, for everyone that wants to know. I, I recorded this session, so it'll be available on our website shortly. Um, so if there's any, anything else anyone has on the, if they have any other questions they want to ask at this time. Go once, twice, sold. All right. Thank you, everyone, for showing up tonight. That was a really great presentation. A lot of really good information. Some new systems. That's pretty cool. Um, and I guess we'll talk about the, the social event next month, and we'll send an email out shortly. So everyone have a great night and be safe. Thanks. Thank you. you. Cheers.